is Terry Bradshaw, quarterback, Pittsburgh Steelers. At 7.15, there's a new home run champion of all time, and it's Henry Aaron. This is baseball, Major League Baseball. And this is ABC's Mel Allen. Monday Night Baseball, live from Fenway Park in Boston, Ready, Massachusetts. Looking, 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 he's under the gun. He's fired, he throws. It is. Hello and welcome once again to the Past Our Prime podcast. Since since I can never get his name right, you know, Bill, I thought, why don't you introduce the show this week? You know, at the very least, you can get your own name. That's right. It's the Past Our Prime podcast with Mark Mahoney, Scott Mahoney, with Mark Hoffman, <laughs> Bill Mahoney, and Scott Johnston. There we Wait, go. You were go. Hoffman. No, you're, you're Hoffman. Hoffman. You're, no. No, you're You know, we're all... <laughs> We're all one. Idiots. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's our common thread. <laughs> yeah. Got a couple of guests lined up for today. Going to talk about the NBA Finals from 50 years ago, because that's what we do. We don't really concern ourselves with what's going to happen. We talk more about what did happen. And we're going to talk with Bob Ryan once again. First time that we're having a guest Back. Guest. Yeah. Right? So good. Good. Couldn't, couldn't have picked a better one, though. You he's, know, two things. One, he's great. And two, he likes us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that right away says something's wrong with him. <laughs> so, you know, you know how you get to be a guest on this show? Yeah. Uh, you say yes when we ask. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. Or you well, say I, just, I just asked Joe at the corner, would he come on the <laughs> show? And he said, yeah, sure. Let me look at my schedule. Let's get him in. <laughs> So we're going to talk to Bob, who covered that Celtics team. He'll be joining us shortly to talk about one of the greatest NBA finals ever between Boston and Milwaukee. And the Bucks. well, they were missing something from those finals, right, Mark? Yeah, they were missing Lucius Allen, who had torn his uh, MCL, I think, two weeks before the playoffs started. And that was a big loss because he was a big part of those Bucks teams. Yeah, he, 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 he will tell us about how that happened because it was kind of bizarre he didn't just, you know, tear his knee up, you know, trying to block a shot and came down wrong. He, it's, it's a very interesting story. So he'll be joining us shortly. Before we get to the scorecard section, Mark, you got an ad you want to oh, share yes, with us? Oh, yes, I do. It's, it's for Ozark Airlines, you know, because if you're going to be a growing airline, you got to keep doing things better. That's why we have new things on Ozark, more nonstop flights colorful interiors you know they even have international flair dinners and their wine and cheese baskets you know if you go on an airline today a wine and cheese basket's a rich cracker that has you know some cheese in it so yeah, right. and i just want to know if if uh jason bateman and laura linney were part of ozark airlines but ah. yeah. but apparently it was a regional airline from 1950 to 1986 and i got bought by dwa but you know yeah, they don't realize they just recycle those planes. Right. They, they just take the name off it, but no, they don't like, oh, that, that one's gone. Throw it away. Yeah, no, they're all in Goodyear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, and in Tucson. Right. I'm sure it was ranked number one for wine and cheese baskets of all yes. the airlines out there. Well, I'll get mine. I'm taking Spirit Airlines next week. I know they have a cheese basket waiting right for me. They oh, do. Oh, they, yeah. Well, they do, but it'll cost you 22 bucks <laughs> <laughs> For one stick. For one, yeah. 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 Uh, that's the funny thing about Spirit is it'll always come up when you do a search, and it's like, oh, my gosh, it's 134 round trip to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But then if you want a seat, a couple of bags, <laughs> yeah. you know, pretty soon it's it's... It's up there. But. Yeah, Callie brings up, she goes, Dad, I need to take a couple bags with me. I said, you're not taking any bags with you. We're taking one. <laughs> she goes, why? I said, we have to pay for everything that goes yes. on that plane. She goes, well, I need to take five babies. I said, unless they're real, we're not taking them. <laughs> no. Yeah, I always tell my kids, I'm like, you can bring as many bags as you want. Glad bags. <laughs> That's a good idea. A good little idea. tuna fish sandwich. Yes. But I like your thought. You said a, a tuna sandwich. I think if I ate a tuna sandwich on a plane, 
They may kill me. Are you done? With a child. Die Someone sure. go, what the, right? uh, big greasy tuna. Yeah. You'd probably be better off, you know, smoking a cigarette. Exactly. <laughs> Just to go the smell on the plane. Oh my yeah. God, that would kill There's you. There's always that one person at like a, at an office setting that like, you know, the whole office is like, someone's reheating salmon in yes. the microwave. What are you doing? It's like, what are you doing, man? On a, on a flight that I went on, I think it was to Hawaii, before we took off, this lady had her shoes off and she was painting her toenails. Nice. Now, that smell it just permeated through the plane. They had to come over and say, what are you doing? Well, I'm painting my nails. I said, put it away. <laughs> the whole plane was like, just covered in that in that smell. So That's very, yeah. You know, it's Sorry, I digress. That, that was the only thing I wanted to talk about, but I just flipped to the next page, and they have one for the Chrysler leasing de system department, I guess, for leasing cars. But the picture they have is two guys in the ugliest plaid pants you've ever oh, seen. Oh, God, you have those two guys? Yes. Yes, they're like golfers. Right. A, a cow and then a girl in overalls. Yes. So yes. very interesting way of tying that all in. And the theme is we're grazing and Tony or pastors now. Did men yeah. really wear pants back then? They the, did. I mean, I, that's unbelievable. I had in the early 70s, I remember I had these plaid pants. One was brown, one was blue. But I mean, people don't even wear shirts like that anymore. No. But oh my God, Thank the pants. God. And then one guy's I, got a sweater vest. I just into always it. wonder, like, the, the, you know, the marketing genius that's like, okay, here, hear me out. We get two dweebs, we dress them in hideously, <laughs> right? <laughs> Now we get Becca in there, okay? Becca, you sit right between them. <laughs> okay. Now I've got Bessie the cow coming <laughs> <Yes>. in. <laughs> They're like, what? Just just go with it, okay? <laughs> Bessie is going to be the key to making people want to lease cars. <laughs> well, I, I've, got to, I've got to ask, just because we're here. I'm sorry for interrupting, Scott. Yeah. I want to know the worst outfits that you... That Mark told me about his, or he just told us. Oh, I just what was yours? Oh, so what was yours? Yeah, you know, I don't really have... There was no year where you look back and go, You know, there's why? a family portrait of, like, my mom, my dad, and all four of us, and we're all wearing Izod's. And mine is <laughs> hot pink. So I got a hot pink I <laughs> Izod on that's, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't, you know, the test of time has not <laughs> no, done well with that I want to see you in a hot pink you know, one. It's, at, it's up at my parents' house. Before we get to the scorecard, score I was going to say we interrupt this program because there was a 30-page... I'm reading this thing. I'm like, what the hell is this? Because the first thing I do when I look at these uh, magazines is how many pages is this? And this one was like 150 pages. Yes. They're yes, usually like, yes, you know, right. in the 110 mark. So... I'm like, either there's a lot more content we're going to have to go through, or there's a 30-page advertisement from the Tourism Board of Canada. Okay, it was only really 16 pages, but it felt like the size of Saskatchewan. So I'm just... I'm going to quiz you, know, you just, on Manitoba just in a second. click, 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 click. And then, you know, before you've even started the magazine, you're on page 40 <laughs> between all the ads and stuff. Any uh, anything from the scorecard for either of you guys? I thought they were uh, not the most no, interesting. I had one tidbit. interesting one, and you I'm think? surprised. Yeah, uh, uh, Scott, you're not talking about this one because it's your team and how cheap Charlie Finley was. Oh, yeah. And and the fact he didn't even want to pay for stamps. Yeah, I mean for, for fan mail, right? Yeah, it's like oh my god. Well, he really wouldn't now. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> He was the one that then tried to sell his players later on. He like sure it, did. And Billy Coon said, no, no, come on. This is this is ridiculous. But I mean, come on. Stamps. But speaking of stamps, I mean, for like for like most of our lives, stamps would go from like 16 cents to 17 cents. Mm -hmm. And then a couple years later to 18 cents. Now they go up by like 10 cents. Yeah. <laughs> and now they don't even tell you. They no. just call them forever stamps. Right. You don't no. even know what they are. Right. right. But at least the forever stamps, you know, are forever. You can use them at any time. Right. They can't over. So if you have a forever stamp from 1918, I guess you could still use it. Well, I thought forever. they had them then, but you know. But how often do you, you know, I, I buy a book of stamps now and it, it can last me a year. It's almost like a checkbook. You used <laughs> right. to have yeah. checks every few thing. months. Right. Now I have checks from when I lived, you know, eight, 10 years ago in Vegas. <laughs> oh, I got the, one though. Oh, go. One, they said it. Rankin Smith, the owner of the Falcons, on the problems of negotiating with pro football players. If he doesn't sign, we lose him. If he does sign, I go broke. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lose-lose situation. 
The Earl Campbell, before you did that one, the Earl Campbell one, the Texas high school, he was a Texas high school football player then. Mm -hmm. This is before the Earl Campbell we know in college or the NFL. And uh, he said, my goal in life is to build a house for my mother. So then she lies down at night, she can't see the Big Dipper. Which would mean he has no... Yeah. Roof on the house. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I wow. didn't think about that for a second. Yeah. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, that, not, this is not here. <laughs> She's <laughs> like, I'm buying myself a house. Yeah. Mom, you're out back. back. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to get you a moon roof in the house. Yeah. yeah. Right. All right, now let's Sorry. get to the Cannon Takes Aim. It's the largest field of horses in Kentucky Derby history, 23 Cannonade wins it in a slow time of 204. How slow? Secretariat won it the year prior in 159. Five wow. seconds. Five seconds in a horse race is a lot. <laughs> it's like, you know, the horse passes the finish line and then. Yeah. And the next one, you know. If anyone can go online and look at the picture from this race. There are so many horses bunched together. Mm -hmm. How can anyone go fast? I right. mean, it's like it's like when you're in rush hour traffic and you have all these cars around you, you can't go fast. But these are live animals. It's amazing mm -hmm. they don't bump into each other or trip. When you're in a car, they're not. The cars aren't alive. You are. But right. I'm saying in horses, they were so closely packed. Yep. It's always amazing to me that a horse doesn't, you know, come up on the next one and maybe hit a hit a back leg. It's just that's, yeah. That's what I was saying about these jockeys. The what how they navigate this. Is yes. It's unbelievable. But, you know, it wasn't only just crowded on the track, but in the stands, they had over 163,000 people there, right. which was a record at that time, including Princess Margaret, Queen Elizabeth's sister. That's right. And you know what? I did not see that episode on The Crown where she right. goes to the Kentucky Derby. No, I didn't either. You know, that's so funny because I was I have all these people of the royal family. You know, I basically know Queen Elizabeth. That's it. Everyone else, yeah. Prince Duchess and all Princess this. Diane. I, yeah, 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 yeah. So if they're dead, I'm, 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 I got them. But <laughs> Princess Margaret, I didn't know anything until I watched The Crown, and then you know, The Crown makes all these people come to life, and so she, she was a party animal. She was a, she was a character. Now, do you guys stop everything when one of them gets married and watch it for twelve hours straight? No, no. neither do I. But you know what I love about this Kentucky Derby race? It wasn't even the race. It's the highlight of this, and I think we can all agree. Was the streaker going up the flagpole? I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> and, and sports literary shows the picture because the flagpole, I guess, is hide certain parts of the streaker, but I really don't think it does. But you know, hey, I just, th I just, th his name was weird. Do you, re do you read about his name, mm. Dickie Burns? I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. We know I got his <laughs> name what are you now? doing up there. <laughs> Those, but you know, when they say to you, "Run it up the flagpole," I guess is what they mean. <laughs> You know, that's a photo finish I'm not interested in seeing, okay? I don't want to hear anyone saying, he won by a... <laughs> we should have got him on the show. That would have been interesting. How yeah. do you get him down from this? he come down or do you they have to like... Gravity. Okay. Yeah. Gravity okay. finally gets him down. But you got to slide down. And you know the fly, sliding down any type of flagpole. And I've never done it naked, but I'm sure there's some friction and some sort of pain. It, yeah, it's... You know what? Okay. In that situation, alcohol is your friend. Yes. It is. Yeah. yeah, you feel nothing. Yeah. Uh, His post position was on the rails. Cannonade <laughs> is ridden by Angel Cordero and trained by Woody Stevens, both uh, future Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. Cordero would win the Derby two more times on Bold Forbes in 75 and in 85 on Spend a Buck, one of eight jockeys to win the Derby three times. He won over 6,000 races in his United States Racing Hall of Fame career. We spoke with NBC Sports' horse racing expert Randy Moss a couple weeks ago about this race and that time in horse racing. So go back and listen to that episode of the Past Art Prime podcast if you want to hear a great story about how the field was so big and how the Derby prepared for that race right. the year after Secretariat. Randy was was great. And, and and it's not the football player, Randy Moss, and he'll yeah. talk about that. Yes. So don't get confused. Randy Moss, the football player, was not a horse racing expert. Not and it was that. also, Cannonade wasn't supposed to be the one that was... The, right. It was Judger. Judger. Judger was the one that everyone was thinking, okay, this is great. Cannonade was an entry into that. Right. That brings us to the centers of attention. As the playoffs between the Bucks and the Celtics got tougher, oh. the biggest question was, could Kareem Abdul-Jabbar... 
the game's best, score often enough to dominate Dave Cowens, the league's second best center. And this is just a crazy series. It's uh, it basically Boston wins game one in Milwaukee, and then for the remainder of the series, the other team wins. So Boston wins game one, Milwaukee wins game two, Boston wins game three, and so on. And f- the last four games are all won by the visiting team. Right. The Bucks win game four at the Garden to even the series 2-2. Kareem goes for 34 in the win. A reporter asked, during his early years with the Warriors, when Wilt Chamberlain was criticized for never winning championships, he used to defend himself by saying he wasn't getting much help from his teammates. Do you sometimes feel the same way? And Kareem answered, you're trying to get me to say that my teammates aren't any good. I guess so, the reporter admitted. I have no comment on that, Ooh. said Abdul-Jabbar. What did he expect Kareem to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah these guys stink. We're tied 2-2 in the NBA Finals, <laughs> and these guys all suck. But, but we all know that, you know, the boss says, make sure you ask him about this. And it's yeah. like questions you go, that guy's never going to answer it, but they want you to yeah. ask it anyway. Yeah. yeah, those bosses that have never set foot into a locker right. room. You know, my favorite story of a boss was one time at CBS, they were cutting back. And I said to this lady who never didn't know sports at all, who was responsible for the budget, that, yeah, we need a crew for post game. It was like a Raiders game or it was an exhibition, but it was a nighttime thing. Mm-hmm. And she says to me, well, can't you get the post game before the game? <laughs> <laughs> Just do it in before. Yes. Uh, that's 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 like the Mark Burley really, story yeah, from, yeah. Uh, from Bill. They know this. You just go and ask them, okay, assume you lose tonight. Can you tell me about that? Now assume that you win. <laughs> you get both, Mark. It's very easy. This was an incredible series. It would go seven games and get this. Like I mentioned, the road team wins five of the seven games. Mm-hmm. John Havlicek is the MVP of the series. 26 points, eight boards, five assists. By the look of it, Seems like it easily could have gone to Dave Cowens, who not only had yeah. to try and stop Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but averaged 23 points, 10 boards, and 5 assists. A very underappreciated, great, great player. He did a lot of the dirty work in that series. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Havlicek obviously got the MVP, but Cowens was the one that was doing a lot of that dirty work on Kareem. Single coverage in certain points, too. Well, what I love about the series, Boston was one and two at home, but they were three and one in Milwaukee in the series, which is right? crazy. That's bonkers. You play all the all year long to get home court advantage, and it means nothing. Yep. At least that year it didn't. Hey, a couple of months ago, we had Bob Ryan on to talk about this Celtics team, a team he not only covered for the Boston Globe, but he picked this team to write a, a, a book about. <clears throat> he started after Russell left after the 69 season, culminating in this championship team. It's called Celtics Pride, the rebuilding of Boston's world championship basketball team. And Bob joins us now. Let's talk just specifically, Bob, about that 1974 team. It was a couple months ago when you joined us and you let me know and and, and our audience uh, what a crazy NBA Finals that was in 1974, a, a home court disadvantage, if you will. It must have been you guys must have been looking at each other in the press row going, oh, my gosh, you had no idea what to expect. For sure it was, and it remains the only NBA finals, and I would be willing to bet Stanley Cup finals uh, that in which the road team won five of the seven games, including the final four games. Yes, every game you're showing up, you're thinking it can't keep going this way, but it did. And uh, it, it started off with a road victory and it ended with a road victory and, and, uh, and quite a, and, uh, lots of strange things in between. Yes, that's correct. Game six, I believe Havlicek hits a shot with under 10 seconds to go to give the Celtics the lead at home. They're going to wrap it up at the Garden. And then Kareem answers with a skyhook. <laughs> so they win it, 102-101, I believe. That was an overtime game, maybe even double overtime. Double overtime. Double overtime. So all the momentum is with Milwaukee heading back home. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. Going back home for yet another uh, home court disadvantage. But it was a, that was an epic game in which uh, uh, people still rhapsodized. Pat Summerall was, was working TV, and he said it was the most exciting game he had ever seen in basketball. And um, it, it, it was it was very dramatic. Um Right. We go back to Milwaukee 
And the one thing that Larry Costello stressed in his in his press conference the day before game seven, we need a good start. We want to make sure we start well. Well, guess what? The Celtics got the opening tap, scored off the tap, stole the inbounds and scored. And it was four nothing after 12 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and so much for the good start. Yeah. And Cowens, Dave Cowens, who had shot five for 18 in game six uh, and had been brooding about it and was determined to have a good game came out and he was, he was hitting, he was eight for 12 in the first half. Southern seas control of that game and had control with one exceptional one stretch for, for, for the whole game. Uh, and, and the key thing though, that the, about that game was for the first time in the uh, competition against Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and going back to Lou Alcindor, remember him, um, they decided to double team him. They would, they never did that. They let this Cowens guard him one-on-one. And they decided to double and triple team him. And they kept him scoreless for over 17 minutes in the middle of that game while they built a 17-point lead. So that was the big strategy. What kind of a player was Kareem as a member of the Bucks? Because people always have this image of him as a Laker. And they forget the beginning of his career. <laughs> and it's serious that dominant he was. Well, he was never as good as a Laker as he was as a Buck, uh, frankly. And for one reason, because in the with the Bucks, he actually rebounded uh, willingly. When he once he got to the Lakers, the rebound became a very a point of great indifference to him. Uh, he really didn't put out very much on that regard. He took that hook shot, that's for sure. But uh, he was a better all around player with the Bucks than he was with the Lakers. He didn't have to be that great because of the comp the, the t- teammates he had. But um, believe me. Uh, that he was frightening in those early days. Uh, that uh, absolutely, uh, he's the only reason that series went seven. Other because that they, they were depleted. You know, they had lost Lucius Allen before it even started. John McLaughlin got hurt in the first game, and Nicky Davis, who was a forward and only a journeyman player, had to be converted into a guard, and and that that was crazy. Ron Fritz Williams could not handle Boston's press. Uh, he carried them absolutely. Uh, average 32 and I believe 15 and and in and the series and uh, yeah, absolutely is the only reason why I ever went seven. You mentioned the injuries and I spoke to Lucius Allen yesterday. If he had played in the series, if he had not torn his MCL, would it have been a much different series with the Bucks of one and six or something? Well, you look at it, what they did without him and you did. And, and as I just said, how Kareem carried them and, and the, the Celtics would not have been as effective with the pressure as they were. Oscar at that point, Oscar Robertson was now 34, 35 years old, not what he was uh, physically. And uh, Don Chaney was frisky, young, 6'5", strong, long arms, great defensive player. And he gave Oscar a lot of trouble in that series. Um, and they didn't have to worry about any speed in the backcourt at all. Allen represented that for the Bucks. I don't think there's any question he would have altered the circumstance. Uh, and, and if he wants to, and believe me, if he wants to think that if, if he hadn't gotten hurt, they wouldn't have won. He's got to be right to think that. You know, we live in an era now, Bob, of these quote unquote super teams, right? Uh, the superstars get gather and, 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 and form these unbelievable teams. But uh, Kareem was asked in, after I believe the, the game game six, you know, if he had the cast to win with, and and he didn't take lightly to to being asked that at that time, but but he really was almost a one man team, like you said. He he carried that te- that team for that series. Uh, the three players of note, the three there are three Hall of Famers on the team: himself, Oscar, and Bob Dandridge, who got it into the Hall a couple of years ago. And Dandridge was young and 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 talented, very talented and quick. The forwards were quick. Dandridge there, and it was Curtis Perry and, and Cornell Warner uh, who definitely were uh, not stars. They did not have the, the roster. The Celtics had a better a better overall roster. And as I said, it, it was Kareem that was the, the, the only reason that they could compete. Now, they actually had the home court because they had won 59 games. Celtics only won, only, quote unquote, 156 that year and really did not have a good last third of the season. They kind of slinked into the playoffs. And, and uh, they weren't playing at their best when they got in. Uh, but once they got there, they, you know, the, I believe it was unfinished business. As you recall, the year before, they had the best record in their history, 68 and 14, but were beaten by the Knicks after John Havlicek got hurt in game three 
and basically was a left-handed player for the rest of the series and, and didn't even play in game four, which was a double overtime loss in New York. Anyway, they, they were motivated. It's a very motivated team in, in uh, 74, uh, but uh, they really weren't as good as they had been the year before. And, and, and a lot of people were, they think they, they were thinking that we're going to get a, a replay of what happened in 73 and an, a, another great regular season, but let's see how they do in the postseason. Yeah. Well, there, there was, there was that issue on them. And remember they had, this group had not won. This is five years post Bill Russell. And um, they, they had a nice uh, upward uh, on the progress on the graph. Once Dave Cowens was drafted in 1970. So after winning, uh, 34 games the first year after Russell. They then won 44 and then 50 some and then 50, and then 68 in the fourth year and, and then set 56. Um, so this, but this was, you know, they needed to get it done to, 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 to get that, uh, what was then the 12th banner. And, uh, and they, they did, but uh, they had two tough series to get, one tough series to get there. Buffalo, Buffalo gave them trouble with a good six game series. So Havlicek in that series wins the MVP. Dave Cowens was right there with him. How good a player was Cowens, not just in that series, but as a player? Sometimes I think he gets overlooked. Yeah, he sure does. And uh, he's a legitimate Hall of Famer, a outstanding, a truly great rebounder, uh, a, a, a good, versatile scorer who could score inside or out. Uh, he had a nice face-up jumper from 15. He, he made good use of it when he would be a trailer on the fast break. Concept doesn't exist anymore. Fast breaks aren't run the way they were once run. They're not orchestrated. They're not beautiful orchestration things. But the, you can't find me one in the league that uh, that no one knows how to run a fast break the way they did or the way the Lakers did or the way the Bullets did in those days. But anyway, Cowens and defensively was tenacious. Uh, six eight going on seven. Uh, he 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 was a he was a white leaper. To be quite honest and very strong. And he lived to rebound. He loved rebounding. First rule of rebounding, guys is do you want the damn ball or don't you? I mean, and, and that's, uh, Dave wanted it and he got it. And, uh, uh, and, and, and he was, he, he made, I said, I used to say more unmakeable plays than any player that, that in the league uh, could run the floor beautifully, never slacked ever. He, he worked hard. Everybody would tell you he was the hardest, as hardest working player as it was in the league. Yeah, that comment you made about rebounding. I mean, Dennis Rodman, Charles Barkley were the biggest guys. They just wanted the ball the most. You know, the rebounding, it's very simple. Uh, you want the ball, number one, established position, number two, timing, number three. Uh, and then with that, it would be strength to hold the position. And then last and least important is jumping. And and the, some of the great rebounders of, of the day uh, got many a rebound below the rim, namely Wes, Un Wes Unseld and Paul Silas. Cowens made his uh, got his above the rim. I assure you that. But you got to want the ball, and that's what you right mentioned. Rodman, Rodman, inch for inch, could maybe maybe be the greatest rebounder ever, including Bill Russell. When you consider percentage of available rebounds and, and the fact he was six seven, um, and he's and Barkley rebounded uh, at both that he was the best two way rebounder in the league in his time, and and Barkley barely was six four. So it just shows you. And I mentioned Kareem earlier, and we got to tell us. I'll just try and illustrate this. Back, if you, let's fast forward to 1985, and the Celtics roll them out on Memorial Day Massacre, 148-114. That's on a Monday. The next game's not till Thursday. Kareem had a bad game and was brooding for three days in, in, in the hotel room in Boston and couldn't wait to get back on the floor on Thursday. And he went out and he got 17 rebounds, the most rebounds he had had in 10 years. Wow. I'll repeat that. The most rebounds he had had in 10 years. You know why? Because he didn't give a damn. Because he wasn't, he was indifferent to rebounding, but not that night. And it just goes to show you. And uh, they win that game. They end up winning that series. Uh -oh. Correct. And he was, and he was not only the MVP of the series, he was Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year, and he deserved it. How patient were Boston fans with the rebuild? Because it really wasn't that long of a rebuild. Uh, but I mean, they were so used to winning that they have patience to even get through that first season post Russell. Well, the team was so entertaining. They ran so well. And and people recognize and Havlicek was beloved by that point, and and uh, Don Nelson was next up on the pecking order, beloved. Uh, people like Satch Sanders was still around for a couple of years, so they they were likable players that the fans knew. And then Cowens, of course, was an instant success, and 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 really was the the, the link to 
to why they started to, to draw patrons at a much better rate than they ever did in the 60s. And and then, you know, yeah, they, they had, and they get better and better. They kept gradually improving. And so, yeah, people, uh, and by the fourth year, they went in 68 games. Oh, my God. And there was a great disappointment where they didn't win. And yet the rationalization was clear. John got hurt. And you could live with that. The only problem is they lost to the Knicks, who people hated. But, you know, <laughs> that's just a great rivalry that exists to this day in every sport. But but uh, the fact is that people gave them that, cut them the slack because how Chuck got hurt. So it's a good thing they won in 74 because then there wouldn't have been any excuses, particularly with the Bucks losing Allen and McLaughlin. It's the first title, as we've mentioned, without Russell. How important was that to have Lecek's legacy to get one without him? John would never go off and, on a tangent about it, but very important. Very important for everybody. Very important for, you know, most important for Red, for our back, because uh, yeah, yeah. everything was you know, linked with Russell and, and rightfully so as the key component, but you know, Red who had moved from the coach to a full, he was always the coach and GM, but now he's just a GM. And this was a team that he had rebuilt and he made moves to ensure it. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and he definitely certainly had reconstructed the team beautifully uh, with draft picks such as Cheney and White and, and, and Cowens and Steve Kaberski, Paul Westfall, who was instrumental in that game seven in 74 and so, and and the trade for Paul Silas, which was pure genius. So that was uh, Red was the one, but John, sure, John wanted to get a a, a ring uh, that didn't include Russell, but it wouldn't have obsessed him. But I think Red really needed it. We've talked about your relationship, uh, your on and off relationship, in the uh, with Tommy Heinsohn. We know about Tommy as a player. We actually know him quite a bit as a commentator. How was Tommy as a coach? Tommy was an interesting story because he was the ultimate in OJT. He had never coached anything in his life, uh, including, you know, bitty basketball. He went from retirement in 865 <laughs> to insurance salesman with, with, with color commentary on the side. And that's what the life he lived from 1966 until 1969 when Russell retired and as, and read rena and named Tommy the coach. So Tommy had never coached anything. And so, you know, and, and also not to mention, he had was now coaching uh, three very important players that he had, um, and four with Larry Siegfried, that he had played with and roomed with Havlicek. And now he's got to be their boss. That is not easy. And, and they're scrutinizing him. They want a real coach. They know that he needed to learn the ropes as a coach. And, and uh, so that was a dynamic that, that seldom existed the way it did with that team. So there was a, a lot going on underneath the surface that the fans wouldn't realize. Uh, Tommy's a very bright, was a very bright man. I mean, he was a brilliant insurance salesman, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> but it was a, no, he was. He, he won awards, for God's sake, in their industry. I'm telling you. I'm oh, not I, making this up. I, 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 I'm saying he seems like the perfect guy to do that kind of stuff. No, that's yeah, so. Uh, and he was bright and glib, and I used to love going around in those days, all those luncheons and, 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 and on the road, and I'd go with him and listen to him talk, and, and he, uh, he had a word he used that you don't hear very often. He used to talk about how we inculcate things into things. Well, not many people use the word inculcate, but Tommy loved that word inculcate. I was associated with him. I haven't heard anybody use it, by the way, in the last 40 years. But <laughs> Bring it back. Anyway, Bring it back. <laughs> now, maybe I should. Um, you know, I socialized with Tommy off the, you know, I mean, the cups of coffee. Tommy wasn't a, a, a corral. I didn't go out drinking with him. I went out drinking with the players. But I did have many a cup of coffee in the morning on the road with Tommy Heinsohn. Um, I needed to learn the NBA. And he was a, a, a guy to help teach me the ropes of the nuances of the NBA. And, and what I didn't learn from him, I learned from the players. But uh, uh, we got along great until we didn't. And, 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 and the problem was that as time went on and I developed relationships with the players, and, and some of their viewpoints were different than his about certain things. And, and uh, uh, he did not like that. I think he thought that I owed him or, or that I, he owned me in that regard. And, uh, and he thought that I was too close to the players. Maybe I was, by the way, but he, he worried too much about it. And uh, so we had a problem. We had a little falling out um, that culminated in the 1976 finals when, when we got to Phoenix uh, for the road games in Phoenix. Uh, I didn't stay at the hotel with the players. I stayed at Paul Westfall's house. So 
got to be the first and only time that the lead writer for the most prominent journalistic institution covering the team uh, was staying at the house of the other team's best player. But that's just the way it worked out. I thought now, it when it was over, so Tommy and I officially weren't talking. And when it was over and they won, I went up to him in the locker room, said, congratulations. And he said, thank you. And we didn't talk for about, then I got off the beat. And, but two years later, there was a testimonial dinner for Jim Luskatoff in town. And I went to it and Tommy was there and I walked up to him and I said, Tommy, would it spoil your night if I said hello? And he said, no. And that was in 1978. And until the day he died two years ago, we were friends. Trust me. I, I thought it was so funny. You talked about what a great insurance salesman he was. And kids today don't understand that back then, athletes didn't make all this money. They had to have jobs during the off season. I remember why a tittle was on a game show and he identified himself as an insurance salesman from Palo Alto, <laughs> California, not quarterback of the New York Giants. So I, I think kids don't understand the athletes were different back then. You know, one of the great examples I love, and uh, uh, the Baltimore Colts, the vintage Colts of the late 50s, right? Uh, they all had jobs. And United was, was, he laid floors. And they said he laid floors for like half the team. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, there were actually guys in that league that were full-time you know, somebody's that also played on Sundays for the in, in the NFL in the 50s. I got to go back. You were talking about Red Auerbach a few minutes ago. What was his genius? I mean, why would anybody, you've talked about the deals he made. Why would anyone pick up the phone when he called? What made him so much <laughs> smarter than all the other GMs? Well, I, I don't know who said it. Someone did say, and it's been quoted by many people about many other people, but I believe it was said about Red Auerbach, and I don't know who said it, that he was playing chess while the other guys were playing checkers. And you'll hear, you've heard that phrase, I'm sure. And 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 I, I'm telling you, that's where it came from. I don't know who gets credit for it. He was smart. Well, sooner or later, you know, you, if, I know you wonder why somebody, you know, if Red did, if like somebody that, you know, you should keep him. Um, but, you know, they, they got to do their job and they just had to look at Red as a, uh, you know, just appear, you know, in that regard. Uh, but he didn't, he wasn't flawless. He didn't, you know, he drafted a guy that he didn't realize wouldn't fly Bill Green back in 1962. That's kind of a detriment to be a professional athlete. Now, uh, I guess he, I don't know. He thought he was going to be able to bus around the country like John Madden, but that, that didn't work out. And he didn't ever had a career, but Red drafted that guy. So that's not doing your homework. Of course, those are the days they drafted out of the magazine, you know, uh, uh, after that, uh, the and, and if you had a buddy who was a, you didn't have scouts, but you may have guys that were friends of yours that might give you some tips. That's how he got Sam Jones. Uh, Bones McKinney was uh, knew about him from North Carolina, and he told Red about this kid at North Carolina College, Sam Jones, and that's how he got Sam Jones. Uh, Bones McKinney had played for Red as a Washington Capitol back in the late forties, but uh, but uh, they didn't have scouts the way they did now. So anyway. I, the answer to your question is a rhetorical question. You know, people felt they had to do business. They took a shot. And most of the time they got burned. You know, uh, besides the players, the big, one of the big characters of Boston Celtics basketball was the arena, the old Boston Garden. Did it have a, a smell or a creaking when you walked on the parquet floor? Was there something about it that you didn't even have to visually see it? You could just kind of sense it in other ways. Uh, you know, I bet it, nobody thought much about this, I'm guessing now, in the early 50s when they were just an also ran team and had yet to win a championship. You know, they, they started playing there in 1946. Uh, they had a, another home court, the Boston Arena, which is still in existence, by the way. It's Matthews Arena at Northeastern University. But uh, that's where their really first game was ever played. But they played in the Garden. And then after they started winning the championships, it starts to develop an aura. Now you got the flags hanging. And people noticed that it was on this parquet floor that nobody else used. And it's developed an aura. But I think it began with the winning. Didn't smell at all like that. Another thing, I mean, I started going there as a fan in, in uh, 1964 when I went to Boston College. And I started covering there regularly in 1969. Uh, it was the intimacy that was there that was so good. Uh, uh, the fans were, were, were the great folks, close proximity. But you, you manufacture this, this myth based on the fact that they won there. You know, and, and, and it takes on a, a life of its own. But uh, if they had never won a championship, people wouldn't be rhapsodizing about the old garden. I promise you that. <laughs> but what made it about that place? I can remember that those Celtics-Lakers 
uh, Showtime years, you know, that the, the Lakers just did not want to go there. Uh, it, it was, well, the, the fans were right on top of you. I remember uh, everyone complaining about how hot it was that the, the Celtics would make it hot on purpose, especially in, you know, I, I, June. number one, uh, the Celtics were and are and remain to this day what they have always been since 1946 tenants they don't own or run or operate or have anything to say about what went on in that building other than how many towels you might get all right they didn't control the heat that's all nonsense now there were in the old garden it's very true it was uncomfortable when it got hot there was no air conditioning and the most famous game is game five in 1984 when we were in the midst of a heat wave in Boston, a, a June heat wave, and game time temperature inside the building when they threw it up was 97 degrees Fahrenheit. And the Lakers, did, they, they just wanted to go home. And the, the fans, to their credit, made it into a happening. The fans embraced it. It was never have so many people worn so few garments as there were that night in that building. <laughs> nothing but shorts and t-shirts for guys. Nothing but halter tops and shorts for women. Uh, and 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 they they just made the crowd. The crowd just made it go. The Lakers they had portable oxygen. Oh, and then you had ML Car going up down with a little portable little electric fan that he was <laughs> waving just for fun. Kareem just. He, he couldn't be more unhappy than he was that night. And and guess what? In the midst of all this, Larry Bird, 34 points, 20, 17 rebounds, and he shot 15 for 20. And after the game, they asked him about the heat. He said, hell, it's hotter than this when I play at home in the summertime. So, you know, so, uh, uh, but, you know, that, that, but Red loved to, to have people, you know, to play into the image that, that they, uh, you know, were controlling things. Hey, they had to suffer in the same heat and and uh, they didn't control the showers or anything else, but people wanted to believe that, uh, you know, and Red was all that, I'm very happy to have them think. It's, it's like a pitcher who, who people think he threw a spitball, right? You know, so you want them to think I it's one of the, it's in my rep arsenal, you know, but it really wasn't. They used to say the same thing about Al Davis, right, Bob? Basically, what it couldn't be is, is they couldn't understand how these guys were so much better at their job. There had to be some sort of cameras in the locker rooms or <laughs> controlling of the thermostat. It couldn't just be and guess, smarter. And guess what those two guys have in common, had in common, both from Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never thought of, by the way. I never thought about that until this moment. There we but go. as soon as you say Al Davis, start thinking about Al, and he and Redder, it's the truth. They're both from Brooklyn. There's your answer. And both genius. <laughs> the last time we had on your show, we did this the trivia segment, 50-50, where I asked you a question from 50 years ago. You had a 50% mm -hmm. chance of getting it right. I think the question I asked you was, is the greatest actor from Boston, John Cassell? And we had a whole discussion. No. That. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a different one, okay? Yeah. So uh, and there was a movie called Celtic Pride. It had Dan yeah. Aykroyd and uh, Damian Wayans about kidnapping a Celtics playoff, a player before the playoffs. Anyway, true or false? What after the credits rolled in that movie, they actually showed the implosion of the old Boston Garden. I can't tell you. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Uh, so I'm afraid I'm true. I'm going to say I'm going to go true. I'm going to go true, but that's a guess. Well, it'd be hard for me to mix stuff up like that up. So you are correct. <laughs> it is true. They showed the Gosson Garden getting blown up at the end of the movie. I, I remember. I do remember. You know, we all took note of that, of course. And uh, uh, yeah. Well, what can I say? That I, I don't think. You know, I don't even think I wanted to see that movie. I don't know why. I guess I. I, I don't know. I, I don't think but, you missed much. But was it sad for you? <laughs> When you watched the implosion of the Boston Garden, when when it, well, that, I try. I just remember that day that you know that that it was finally done. You know, we watched it. Uh, they picked apart, picked it apart, and then they finally finally did it. So I'm sure everybody, you know, you're uh, you're watching the six o'clock news, you know, whatever. Back when that mattered, you know. <laughs> you know, I I think I can speak for my two friends here, Bob, that we could talk to you all day, especially about those '80s Lakers Celtics matchup. As a as a writer who covered those, yeah, you look back now and go, God, I was so lucky to be a part of that. 
without question, yes. And it's not just, and that that's the key to it. Those, those, all those Boston, just four in a row, four out of five years, you know, we, we had it. And, and that, that, that was fantastic. But, um, uh, three, out of, three out of four years, 84, 85, 87, and 88. Uh, 87, three, three out of four. Um, it was just a whole decade in, in general. I say often, if I could go back and relive January 1st, 1980 to January 31st, 1989, professionally, I would do it back. And it's every bit of it, every good, the bad, the indifferent. There were very little indifferent. Uh, it, would, it was the golden era. And you, and if you, I promise you, if you had uh, a poll of septuagenarians such as myself who covered lived through all that and and what's your favorite time ever covering the nba i would better be unanimous they say the 80s everything worked in the 80s for us access personalities drama on the court uh it was the, it was a wonderful time and and i certainly the memories are, are just very 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 uh fond yes <laughs> but uh, this but highlighted of course by those trips to LA for us and their trips here, and, you know, the all the whole pageantry of it, the Jack Nicholson mooning the crowd in Boston, and and you know all that stuff as well. Yeah, it was, it was all part of the fun. You know, I think the NBA is still living off that time because guys like us, that's when I fell in love with the league. It's thanks to guys like you that were telling the stories for guys like us to read and 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 eat up. And I can't thank you enough. For then and for now, for joining us, I told you we'd have you out in time, so I'm going <laughs> to say goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Well, Appreciate your time. Uh, thank you guys for allowing me uh, to, you know, to uh, indulge myself in this too. Because any any time I get to talk about those days is a big good day for me. Thank you guys. So there you have it, a guy who uh, a bird's eye view not only as we were talking about those Showtime days from when we started really watching basketball, but back 50 years for that unbelievable series between the Lakers and the, and the Bucks, basically Kareem Abdul-Jabbar <laughs> against Cowens and Havlicek and, and Chaney and Red Auerbach and Tommy Heinsohn. It was, he was outmanned and yet they still went seven um, shows you how great a player. That and, and it was, was funny because that was one of his last glory moments with the Bucks. And I, I remember I did a show with him, and he actually said that he went to the Bucks and said, look, I'm not going to renew my contract. So, you know, I just want to give you the heads up so you're not caught off guard. And I'd like to go to either the Knicks or the Lakers in New York, L.A. I like how Bob talked about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lou Alcindor, Sindor, how he didn't care as much about rebounding as his career went on because Kareem was a good rebounder, a great rebounder with the Bucks, And then you find out he had, what, 17 in 1985, and that's the best he had in 10 years. It's amazing how Kareem just sort of gave that part of his game up. I guess you have to piss him off. And then yeah. He'd be like, yeah. okay. But, but Chick Chickern always used to say, Kareem's mad. This isn't good now. Yeah. You, When Kareem gets mad, he doesn't play well. So, you know, it just whatever got in his craw that night to say, okay, I'll show you what I can do. Bob Ryan spoke briefly about the Bucks being shorthanded for the 74 NBA Finals. That's because they played the entire playoff series without one of their key players, their starting point guard, Lucius Allen. That 74 series could have gone an entirely different direction if they had Allen. And joining us now, hopefully fully recovered from that knee injury from 50 years ago, <laughs> is Lucius <laughs> Allen. Lucius, thanks for joining us on the Past Our Prime podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You know, this is Scott, right? That hey, look at that. You got it. <laughs> Let's start with those finals, Lucius. How difficult was it for you personally to watch your team from the bench against those Celtics and not be able to participate? You know, it's really not describable in words because you can see what's happening. And when you're not playing on the floor, you get a, a, a coach's view of what's happening. And the Celtics were wearing Oscar down. Uh, they full court pressed. And by the time we got to the fourth quarter, I mean, I don't care who you are. The pressure that the Boston Celtics were able to put on Oscar was crazy and i know that i could have gone in and broken all of that pressure up because i had the quickness and the ball handling ability to uh 
to actually play well in those type of situations, they were going to full court press. Lucius Allen was going to shine. Right. So it's very, so, difficult. So ba- very difficult. They they not only knew you weren't out, but they played to to the the strength of not having you out. They they made the, you guys pay for that, didn't they? Yes, they did. And, you know, that's what they were supposed to do. I mean, Boston, they were a gritty team, and they had the great defense, uh, you know, especially in the backcourt with, with uh, you know, with, with their guard play. Um, and they had the power to... Uh, equalize Kareem. No one could really uh, uh, stop Kareem, but they had the power to uh, equalize him with Dave Cowens out there. What was it like playing in Milwaukee? What kind of a town was it for basketball? The greatest town that you can imagine. I don't think I paid for many dinners in Milwaukee. (laughs) (laughs) When I first got there, and uh, I think when we won the championship or we were getting ready to win the championship, they gave everybody cars. Uh, we had a car so that we could get to and from my house to the game. And it was free and it was a very nice automobile. Bob Dandridge, uh, Super Bob, he messed it up. He yeah. wrecked one of the cars, man. And so uh, we lost our car. But that city was uh, hungry for a championship. That city was hungry to be on the map. And we gave them something to be proud of. So this is a great city to be in. Did the fact that you were able to win a title in Milwaukee before the 74 season, did that help a bit and take the sting out of the loss? Or anytime you get that far, it just hurts a lot to lose in the finals. Well, we were the best team. It it hurts when you know you're the best team. Uh, I think we had the best record uh, uh, the last two or three years in the league. Um, We had, I had reached a point in my career where I was playing the absolute best basketball that I had ever played in the NBA. And to not be able to go out and showcase how much better I had gotten, uh, I had to sit there and watch from the sidelines as we, uh, as we got, as we got worn down. Lucius, this is Bill. Explain to me how the injury happened. How did it take place? Oh, it's interesting because uh, watching the playoffs, I saw where people were throwing things on the floor like water bottles from a bench. Come on, guys. Mm. With me, I had uh, finally gotten to a point where I could compete with Dave Bing. And we were playing in, uh, in, you know, we're in Detroit. And Bob Lanier and Dave Bing were a tough out for us. And I... uh, Went, I jumped up and tried to block Dave's shot uh, on the sideline. He got the shot off, but I got it, uh, you know, I got, I tipped it and I was really feeling good about myself. When I uh, landed, my leg slipped out from under me. And within two seconds, I had a medial collateral damage to my knee. You know, I, I, I tried to turn my leg around and walk and the, my whole foot turned around and did a 360. So uh, Mm. I uh, knew that it was something bad and I had never had an injury before. So I uh, figured that I could probably do like I always did, you know, take a few aspirin, put some ice on it and come back. No, they took me. Walk walk it off. (laughs) (laughs) They took me to the hospital and said that was it for my season. Mm. That must have been devastating. It was very devastating because I thought I was, uh, you know, I thought I was Superman. I didn't think I was going to get hurt. You know, when I jumped, I knew where I was going to land before I jumped. Uh, I'd gotten gotten to that point, but I didn't see the towel. And to see uh, fans and even people from someone's bench throwing things on the floor because of a referee's call, uh, I had to uh, turn the thing off. I couldn't look because it's so dangerous to have uh, right, right. things happening like that. You know, it's hard enough to play the game without falling and, and jumping on someone on the top on someone's shoe and turning an ankle or, or, or tearing up something. Uh, but to have other things out there that shouldn't be out there—that's uh, that, that, that's something that really hurts me. Uh, they don't know that it. For me, it was the beginning of how I changed uh all of a sudden it took 
two years to recuperate, to get back to that level where I was. And then uh, they decided to break the team up. Uh, they break the team mm -hmm. up. I go to L.A. I never win another championship. I felt when I was playing with Oscar, I'm playing with three Hall of Famers, Oscar Robertson, Bob Dandridge, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I know how to pick my teammates, and we had jailed as a <laughs> unit. And we really felt that um, we were going to win this thing and keep winning this thing for, for years until that injury happened. And uh, Speak uh, everything changed. Speaking of teammates, you began a relationship with Kareem or back when he was Lou Alcindor back at the UCLA days, and you were roomies too, correct? That's correct. Talk about your... Talk about your relationship with Kareem all the way from the beginning days at UCLA. <laughs> well, when he first got to UCLA, Kareem was an introvert. Okay, he didn't want to didn't want to deal with people too much, and we were roommates. And uh, you know, Kareem was the reason we got kicked out of the dorm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the guys were having a water fight with balloons on our floor. You know, they were just having fun throwing. And Kareem was probably the messiest guy that you could have as a roommate. So all his clothes were on the floor. And the water from the water balloons came under our door and wet Kareem's clothes. Uh, uh -oh. you know, and, uh, obviously, uh, Kareem, being from New York, wanted to go out and beat up the whole dorm. And I, <laughs> I had it back. And so we both got kicked out of the dorm. <laughs> slapping a few people around and doing some things we should have done. And of course, uh, the worst thing that happened out of that was I got a call where I had to go talk with Coach John Wooden in his uh -oh. house. Now, it was great to go see Coach Wooden when we went to his house. We ate now, you know, it's great. But you did not want to be called to the office. And uh, <laughs> needless to say, I was a scared young man. <laughs> uh, you know, living with Kareem, uh, it was great, uh, especially, you know, we uh, uh, kind of had our own TV show. So all of our games were televised and uh, made us, you know, made us very popular and very popular on campus. So it's really nice to be around Kareem, with all the, you know, with all the swimsuits. We go to the beach, you know, swimsuits go running up to him and I just kind of, you know, I take whatever he didn't want, you know, so I had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> hanging, out with the, hanging out with the big fella, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, you were a good wingman. Yeah, 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 that was it. Wingman, <laughs> that was me. <laughs> you know, I feel like we talk often about the debate between the GOAT, right? We're always talking the GOAT, Michael Jordan and LeBron and, and Kobe. I feel like Kareem doesn't get his just due for how – dominant he was you know i mean starting at ucla but then you know going at milwaukee and then his time with the lakers all the way up people forget he played until what was it 87 88 i mean long career but there was a time when he was unstoppable i'll tell you this if i had to choose my greatest team the first player I would choose would be Kareem Abdul. I'm sorry, Lou Alcindor, because he was a young Kareem Abdul Jabbar. And at that time, he had just developed because they changed what they did, they did the best thing in the world for Kareem when they changed the college rules that you could not dunk. All of a sudden, Kareem had to do like the rest of us and practice. You know, he had to become a player. And um, Abdul Jabbar, I'm sorry, Alcindor. Um, when you have a guy who jumps up and the rim is below his chest, and if you can think of it, a seven footer with a 37 inch vertical, every shot that he shot, which was one, the hook shot, if you blocked it, it was goaltending. I'm telling you. And then on the defensive end, uh, we had a great zone press because we had quickness and we wanted them to beat us so that we could kind of funnel them into the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar area, which was anywhere from the free throw line 
to the sideline extended. He covered all of that area for us in our press. And he either blocked the shot, stole the ball. I mean, he was a great hook to suck those people into our zone press. So defensively, you couldn't score against us. So we were, you know, we were too tough. Offensively, you couldn't stop us because we were too quick and he was too, too dominant. So for me, I saw Kobe. I saw Michael. I saw LeBron. I've seen all of them except Bill Russell. And if I had to choose, my first player that I would ever choose would be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I did a show with Kareem about 10 years ago, and he talked about that. He was very honest with the Milwaukee management. And after, you know, X amount of seasons, he came up to him and said, look, this is going to be my last season in Milwaukee. I'm not going to resign, and I wanted to give you the heads up. And I wanted to play in either New York, L.A., so I wanted you to give the time to figure out where to go. Um, did that? Did you know that Kareem's time in Milwaukee was coming up? Yes. That it was going to be short. Yes, he told me. Uh, he told me he had. Uh, after we won the championship, he told me he had done his job for Milwaukee. Hmm. They won the championship, I think, was our second year, maybe third year in the league, I forget. Uh, but <clears throat> he felt then it was time for him to come to L.A. He didn't really, you know, he loved New York because he's from New York, but he wanted to come to L.A. because of the climate. Mm. And uh, that's where he ended up. And he brought someone with him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, the other way around. I was traded the year before to Los uh -huh. Angeles. I think I had my best year in the NBA. I think I averaged 20 points, eight assists, four steals, three steals, or something like that. My best year in the NBA, and we barely won 20 games. Right. And I right. that's when I really, because I always, you know, I always felt I was a better player than Kareem. I could do more things. I just wasn't tall. You know, so heck, I could. And then I realized height matters. <laughs> yeah watch that famous bobby knight uh quote you can't teach height <laughs> that's right so i think goody and i i was playing with gail goodrich i think we were two of the leading scorers so you know in the west anyway for guards and you know playing our playing our butts off we won maybe 21 22 games kareem came automatically we started we won 50 so that's when i realized he was worth every cent because he made a big difference for us. Huge difference for us. I mean, we're in the Western Conference Finals. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got hurt again because that started my, uh, that, that knee injury started my cascade of injuries uh, that hurt mm. me and hurt our chances after Kareem came to Los Angeles to win another championship for LA. You know, it's, uh, it, it's uh, amazing. When I uh, played, which I played eight out of my 10 years with Abdul Jabbar, uh, you know, I felt that I was supposed to win every year. I thought we were right. knocking at the door. Well, going to UCLA probably, you know, primes you for thinking that way, I imagine. You know, you win as a sophomore. You have this unbelievable freshman team at UCLA. Then you win it all your sophomore year. You win it all again your junior year. What was that like just, you know, knowing when you stepped out onto the court back then that you guys were the best? It was, it was you know, it was something that as time went along, your confidence got stronger and your, your, your will to win got stronger because everywhere you went, you knew you were going to get the best from that team. And then sometimes you're going to get a team that wouldn't even play. I mean, so we had to really work on uh, ourselves. And that's how Coach John Wooden, he made other people worry about us. I never, we never got scouting reports. We never got this or that. But when we, uh, when we would make a mistake, we didn't make individual mistakes. We all had to run Polly Pavilion. You had to run up as a team and you ran down as a team, you know? So we really became very precise and confident that whatever we were going to do, nobody was going to be able to stop it. A couple of teams came close, not many. Houston beat us once. And, and that's the only game that I really felt that we lost. Even though we lost, I felt we should have won. If Mike 
Warren, who I had the ball, if Mike does Warren that stays where he's supposed to stay and doesn't cut in the way. <laughs> Lynn Shackelford was going to hit a wide open jump shot on the baseline because he always did. And we were going to walk away with the victory. It was that's what I felt was going to happen. Well, it seems like you've gotten over it, so that's yeah. good. But also, you, also, you came back. I, you know what? I don't remember you. any yeah. of the wins. I only remember the losses. Uh, yeah, well, there's only two of them. <laughs> Goodness. But if you look back, Lucius, they beat you by two. Houston did, but you came back and beat them by 30 just a couple months later. So it wasn't, you know, you were right on that. You probably would have taken them down that day, too. That's right. I think I think you would have. But uh, Elvin lets me know, you know, we won the day. <laughs> uh, Elvin's a very good friend of mine now. And uh, uh, we uh, used to go and take trips as a, as, with the NBA. And I went into Elvin. He'd have his family, and i have my family. And my son, when he was, uh, I think it was about a year and a half, jumped into the deep end, didn't know what it was. And uh, was drowning. Elvin saved him. So now Elvin is oh, you know, wow. a, a bitter enemy. He's my one of my better friends, man. <laughs> oh wow! So uh, he uh, and he lets me know every time I see him that that was his day. Okay, I got to go. For you. you won it. So uh, <laughs> we, uh, we keep it there. You know, it's too bad that freshman team couldn't yeah. play for the championship because you would have won another championship with that freshman team you had. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we've we've been practicing with each other, or, or you know, in, in the uh, fall we've been playing uh, lots of scrimmages, and uh, you know we're beating the crap out of these guys. Me and Kareem, you know, we're just beating them. So we're beating them so much we stopped letting Kareem play. You know, he was. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're gonna play Kareem, you gotta shoot jump shots. No hooks, no blocks. <laughs> says, Forget that. I'm not gonna play. And so we'd be playing, and we were still beating those guys. And so when the freshman varsity game came around, we were shocked. We felt that we were great. And then the ratings came out uh, for the for the colleges and. The guys that we were beating were rated number one in the world. I mean, in the, not in the world, but in the nation. They were the best yeah. team in the nation rated, you know, preseason. And we went in there, fired up, and said, we're going to beat these guys. And we did. <laughs> and the slogan on campus was, you're number one in the nation, but you're number two on campus. And boy, you <laughs> talk, talk trash. And, uh, uh, and that was just a great, great, great feeling for me. Uh, I think that, did I hit the first bucket? Yeah, I think I made the face first bucket in that game. I was so fired up. And uh, did 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 you score the first points at Poly Pavilion too? Yes, I did. The first. Yes, point. I did. And that was it. Those were the first points that we opened yeah. up Poly Pavilion. That was our first wow. game, blue goal game, and we beat the varsity. And John would never had that game again. <laughs> it was probably your toughest game of the year. Yeah, yeah I think it, yeah, I think it certainly was. I think it certainly was. We were, you know, we were scoring a lot of points. We had five five super super players. Uh, a guy by the name of Kent Taylor. You guys don't know much about him, but he was a super player. He was our fifth. We had Shackleford, myself, Kareem, and Heights, and uh, we, we were all getting to know each other as freshmen. And this guy Kent Taylor could really play also. I think he ended up going to Houston. Come to think of it. So we do a, a trivia section here. It's called 50-50, okay? okay. I'm going to give you a 50% chance of getting something correct, technically from 50 years ago, but this isn't, okay? Okay. Uh, so, here, so here's your question. So I'd mentioned how, you know, Kareem had asked for the trade out of Milwaukee, okay? But he still gave back to the state. True or false? Or no, this isn't actually true or false. Multiple. This is A or B. He did a public service announcement for Wisconsin tourism with another person, okay? And they recreated a scene from one of his movies. Was it A, Airplane, or was it B, Game of Death with Bruce Lee? Oh, okay. Now, at that time, he was heavy into Bruce Lee. And I think Airplane came after it. So I'm going to go with the Bruce Lee. Okay, it was actually Airplane. <laughs> Robert Hayes, who was the lead in Airplane, he and Robert Hayes are in the plane recreating that scene. He's Roger Murdoch. And they're pointing out, though, different sites in Wisconsin where you can go and what's great tourist stops. 
I can't, I can't believe Kareem gave back like that. You know, at that time, because he was all into Kareem at that time. No, this was, he did this PSA, I want to say, around 2013, something like that, oh, around there. Okay. That was oh, 50 years ago. Oh, okay. I, I, I say that because that didn't sound like the young Kareem from the walk. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the mature Kareem. This is the wiser, mature Kareem. Oh, yes. oh my gosh. That's uh, yes. great. Well, that's, that's good. Hey, you know, he, you know fi- he, finally, that, that influence you had hey, on yeah. him finally took started to take, yes. you know, have an effect. But it took till around 2012, 2013. So, you know, it finally <laughs> happened, though. <laughs> oh, God. Well, you know, he really he really is a great person to be around. Now. Funny, you know, he's personable and he's got personality and, you know, he's got insight. And plus, he's a historian now, you know. So yeah. Right. He's, really, he's got it all. He's really come. A, he's really gone full circle. I just have to ask you one more thing. And on all your emails and stuff, you have a little saying at the bottom, okay? And it says, smile, it's contagious. Where did that come from? What is it to you? For me, I have a glass that is always half full. No matter what the circumstances are, I have always had a vision of no matter where I am, that it's going to be better. And the reason it happens is because in my soul, I'm happy and I'm smiling. So I'm telling everybody, give yourself a smile and not worry. Man, I don't think I can top that yeah, off. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I've been smiling this whole time, yeah. Lucius. So thank you so much for joining us, spending yeah. us some time. I want to tell everyone out there that... You know, Lucius is a Zoom pro. He figured yes. it all yes. out. He's, he's tech savvy. You know, he's, he's he's ready to give a. He's a, a technical magician. He's be if you down. have computer problems yes. at home, call Lucius. Lucius. Call Lucius. Yes. Oh, that's great, guys. I really enjoyed this. And look forward to it, and it's, 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 it's met all my expectations. So, thank you so much for having. You're welcome. Thank you for being yeah, on. Bless thank you. you so thank much. you. Thank man. you, Lucius. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. You know, one thing we've had um, a few now of of. UCLA guests from that era, Larry Farmer, we had on. Yep. And we we talked about how they don't care about the student athlete uh, mm-hmm. anymore. Right. They did then, and yeah, you can yeah. tell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They because sure did. these guys are smart. They're yep. sharp. Yep. They 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 have an, an unbelievable attention to detail. Yeah. Positive outlook. They're just. They're I don't know if they make them that way anymore. They're confident in themselves without being arrogant and right. They got a, they got a humbleness yes. to them. Yeah. And I loved Lucius Allen when he was with the Lakers. That's when I first saw him. I just I loved it. I loved the name. Right. I loved the way he played. I loved it. Yeah. I, you know. Just a just an absolute delight. And you know he probably is has two rings instead of just the 71 championship yeah. Yeah. he probably has a second one in 74 if not for that injury right. and that injury set him back we don't know how many rings he could add he was a, he yeah. was oh, that right. type of player yeah. that that would have fit in and been one of the top guys so yeah. it's a towel and, and, a towel right, changed a towel his life the side of the court. changed his life but you know you could be you, a lot of guys would be they'd look back at that with still a little bitterness, bitterness. to that you, no trace of that so let's move on from basketball to the world of tennis Doubles used to be a big thing. Mm -hmm. Mixed doubles, McEnroe and Fleming, the Bryan brothers. And you know what? The the world's greatest singles players would play doubles. And and it it was – I loved watching it. In the same tournaments. In the same tournaments. You would would see where, like, you know, Arthur Ashe – was in the finals of the singles and the finals of the of the doubles and the finals of the mixed. I mean, they played it all. Now, I don't know if it's agents or they just are like, no, we're not expending any other energy. You know, Djokovic, you're going to be playing Nadal, and I can't have you playing doubles as well. I don't know if that's the reason behind it. Maybe there just wasn't the money involved. But, but 50 right years there. ago, doubles was a valid part of tennis it no was longer. it was but a lot of guys were throwing it because there wasn't any money in it there really wasn't any money in it so the guys were actually they said the pros were coming out and saying let's just get out of here we're not going to get paid for this anyhow obviously now a little bit before before you mentioned McEnroe and Fleming and the Bryan brothers have really made it a, a thing again and I think guys now to practice just to be in doubles because there's the money but there's one of the, the guys in here what is it uh 
Fru McMillan and Bob Hewitt doubles, they made 20000 apiece to win a big doubles tournament. Nowadays, the champions in main draw doubles get $700,000. Wow. So now guys will play in it, not the major ones. Right, right. Not the right. major ones. But, but, but it's, now, it's now back to being, let's get doubles, guys, because you can get some money in it. But for a lot of these players, too, is like like the South African team that won this tournament yeah, in Montreal, yeah, that was, uh, which was uh, John Newcomb and uh, Owen Davidson. Yeah. Individually, they weren't like great players, yeah. but together – Two was better than one. They were a force as a doubles team, and they won that tournament. Yes. So for a lot of these players, the only way we can make money is by doubles, even if it's not that That's much. That's right. 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 No, I, I think it's sad because, like I said, I used to enjoy that part of the game. And, you know, throwing tennis is, is nothing new. There's times when, like, they'd say, like, Agassi would be, you know, up a set but down three love in the second set. Yep. And he was like, eh, I'm not going to expend energy. I've, I've lost this set. I'm down two breaks already. Mm-hmm. Yep. And he would he would throw the second set and just get to the third set. But throwing matches, complete matches, that can't have gone over too well once they found out that was happening. Well, in 74, I think it was it was a known Common fact knowledge. that they did that. Yeah, they, yeah, wow. That's what they were doing. It's, yeah. it's interesting, too, looking at the pictures here, the old wooden rackets. Yes. And they, the faces look so small. Right. It's like, you know, how could they yeah. hit it? Yeah, see, I got yeah. my tennis experience from Bachelor Party. <laughs> right. With Tom Hanks. High drive center field, gone! <laughs> right, right. Another one. It's another <laughs> one. Uh, try to keep it in play. <laughs> my experience in tennis was almost blinding some kid. We were playing doubles. Oh, my God. And... And he went on my side of the court, and I did a forehand, and it caught him right in the eye. Nice. And I was, I don't know, Loser. nine years old at the time, and my mom came to pick me up, and I got into the car. And I might have told the story before, but I go to her. The ambulances are showing up. <laughs> I go to my mom. Let's go. Let's go. She goes, Mark, why are the ambulances here? No, let's go. Go, go. And then she wouldn't go. I, was like, I felt like. But the guy came back, and you fortunately, it was okay. You were the scene of a crime yeah, I was. Night. I was a fugitive. That, that kind of makes you look like you might have done it on purpose. Exactly. <laughs> Poor I was so relieved when he did come back and he was okay and he could yeah. see out of that eye. Get out of the yeah. car! <laughs> <laughs> nice. Very very good. Taking out uh, young yep. Jimmy's eye. I'm an enforcer. <laughs> Rhubarb's hassles and other hazards. Uh, this is uh, an article, a two-part series, part one here by Oakland A's new manager, old manager for that matter, Alvin Dark. He, he wrote this with a writer from Sports Illustrated. I thought I found it very interesting. Just some really great insights into into managing. He gives an example of trying to do something unorthodox as a manager, and having it work the way you had hoped, but just not executed. So so you can get you know raked over the coals for doing something that's kind of weird. And it works out exactly. So here's what he did. In Detroit one night, I'm managing the Indians. We had a right-handed relief pitcher in the game going pretty good. Detroit got a man on with two out. So I brought in a left-hander to pitch to a left-handed batter, but I didn't want to take my right-hander out of the game because he was still going strong and our bullpen was depleted. So I moved him to third and put our third baseman, whom I didn't want out of the game either, on first. The batter then hits an easy grounder right to him at first. Perfect. All my converted third baseman has to do is field the ball and touch the bag. He fumbles it. Next guy triples. Two runs score. We lose. (laughs) (laughs) Scratch that idea. Right? (laughs) So, you know, the the best laid plans. But uh, Alvin Dark was rookie of the year as a player. Started the rally that ended with the shot heard around the world by Bobby Thompson. He was the captain of that 51 Giants team. That's right. And it's amazing. For people that don't know that 51 season, they were 13 games back on August 11th. They won, I think, at 1.16 straight and 37 out of 44 just to force a three-game playoff with the Dodgers. It wasn't a one-game playoff. It was a three-game playoff when Bobby Thompson hit the game-winning homer. And and they are, by by many accounts, a book by Joshua Prager. It's a great book. I forget what it's called. But they're the original Astros. They were cheating hmm. that whole time. They had a guy oh, in yeah. center wow. field with binoculars and he was getting the signs from the catcher, and they would relay oh. it to the hitters. And lo and behold, <laughs> they won sixteen in a row and started. Wow. But yeah, it's a great book. It's a great book. With the Giants, the New York Giants, Dark and the Dodgers got into a fight after Jackie Robinson creamed someone after bunting. Mm-hmm. This was after Jackie had almost taken one in the ear, so he was out looking for blood. Dark hits a double. He never stops heading for Jackie, who's playing third. 
Jackie braces when I left the ground 15 feet from third, a complete wipeout, caps, helmets, glove, ball, everything goes flying, including two adult males, one a black Brooklyn player, one a white Southerner. The way Robinson tells it, I almost put him in the scat, in the seats. He said later he'd have done the same thing in my position, but you couldn't hurt Robinson, and if you did, he, would, he wouldn't let you know it. If I'd broken his leg, I'm sure he would have gotten up and walked to third base. He was the greatest competitor I ever saw. Alvin Dark was later accused of being racist as a manager, yeah. and one of the guys who came to his defense was Jackie mm -hmm. Robinson. And, and Willie Mays, too, came to his yeah. defense. But it's interesting. He made, he, in an article, he said something to, to the effect that minorities weren't up to white players and their uh, mental acutement or, or mm -hmm. whatever, which is what got Al Campanis fired yeah. from his job. But, you know, Dark was back working within a few years. But didn't, right. didn't Al Campanis double down, though? They yeah, he tried, did. They tried and it was to a get different him out time. of it. it was on night and he, yeah, everyone didn't hear this comment by Dark. <clears throat> yeah, Everyone yeah. heard the Campanis right. one. But, I mean, you know, a lot of the players came to defend him, and he said he was taken out of context. And, again, there's no video yeah. like yeah. there was with right. Campanis that you can play over and over again. The thing I see about Alvin Dark is, and it, mind you, I found it out when I was reading the article, I didn't know he was a player. Right. Because when I was a kid, the managers were just managers. I had no idea what they did. And I'm sure there's kids that watch baseball now that don't look at certain players or look at certain players and go, wonder what he did before he managed. I just thought, man, here was a guy that was a above average player. He was uh, managing San Francisco. They lost a tough game. And afterwards, he throws a metal just stool. Just about to do that. Ugh. Right? Mm. What happened, Billy? He, no. gets, he throws go. this metal stool. No. Well, unbeknownst to him, his finger gets caught in Ugh. it as he throws Ugh. it, and it rips the tip of his finger off. Ugh. But he's so mad, he doesn't even realize it until someone points it out that there's blood everywhere. And so. the bone was sticking oh. out of his finger. Oh. Yeah. All right. You know, so my uh, wife's just fainted. So yes. that's nice. Uh, and someone found the tip, and they put it in a pickle jar, or or, <laughs> or had it pickled in a jar. Oh, my oh God. Oh, my God. Oh that was God. the tipping point for him, right? Well, I yeah. <laughs> and I will tell you, having broken my leg and had it pop out Ugh. and put it back in, uh -huh. it's not a it's not a good feeling. No, no. 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 Uh, did uh, when it happened to you? Did you know it? Well, or did someone have to tell you? No, I knew because a girl ran a stop sign. And I hit her fifty five broadside, so I knew when I when I <laughs> when I was on the passenger seat after the wreck. I just looked down and my leg was hanging reversed oh. yeah. and I had to pick it up and push was, it back in. Was it numb? So, cause like when I, you, when you first get in a wreck, your body, um, shock shuts everything down. So you don't feel it. So at first when my leg was, I lifted my leg and I thought, man, my leg feels weird. I can't feel it. And then it just hung there and reversed. So my foot was going the other way. And I thought that doesn't look right. So as I pushed it back in, it didn't hurt. Mm. It started to hurt when my car was on fire, so they picked me out, put me in a, on, on the curb. That's when it started to hurt, about yeah. maybe five minutes later. Yeah, the adrenaline starts yes, to wear off. Yes, and the body's reaction to that. At first, it was like, oh, I'm good, great, right, you know. Right. So, I can yeah. walk either right. way. Let's go! I remember the I guy mean, tried to carry me out, and I said, I'll walk out of here, and then I looked at my leg, I thought, you can carry me. <laughs> I mean, I broke fingers, but that oh, that's, that was, no, that's nothing really, like, but there was the famous Jason Kendall play, where he broke his foot yes, at the bottom of his leg, the, yes, and then yes. ran another step, yes. and then realized, oh crap and you've yeah. seen that video yeah it is it's grotesque. every time i see that well yeah. is it what we saw when i remember monday night football was it napoleon mccollum yeah. had his oh, knee pushed well, his reversed. knee went the wrong way oh god yeah i was at that i just anytime i think of bones sticking out of legs my hands get all sweaty sure and, yeah sure but it's should. funny because the most pain i ever had wasn't from broken bones it was a either getting blindsided and the wind gets knocked yeah. out of you where you don't you, you can't breathe and you think you're gonna die or i mean i um came down on my ankle turned. And while I didn't really hurt it severely, that initial pain was just, oh my God, I thought I was going to die. Yes, yeah, that, I, yeah, yeah. The biggest pain I've ever had was taking fluid out of my knee. Oof. That was the most, even over the broken leg, that was the most, because when you, when you get a broken leg, your leg heals, sometimes fluid goes in your body. So, oh, that hurt, man. This rem Do you guys remember that old SNL skit with uh, Billy Crystal, and I forget who the other guy is, and they, they, they'd say things like, have you ever taken a knife and just cut <laughs> oh, in between no, your fingers? Oh. And he goes, uh. oh, God, I hate when that happens. <laughs> Gosh, that. So that's what we're uh, yeah, we sorry about that. kind of going. Yeah. You know, All because of Alvin Dark yes. cutting his stupid finger off. 
R- Ronnie Lott was all right with it. He should have been all right with uh, it. Are we going to start doing the scene from Jaws where we're going to compare like injuries? Yes. So, you think that's bad? Yeah. Wait till you see this. Bill will win. <laughs> Bill <laughs> will gotcha, win. Gotcha yes. on that, man. Shorten the tour and improve the game. The world's best golfers golfer offers some ideas to intensify competition by Jack Nicholas. Yes. That Jack Nicholas. He writes, I'm convinced that over a period of time, the tour must be made shorter and more cohesive with a definite beginning and a decisive climactic ending. Really what he wanted was fewer tournaments. Right. And he thought that there'd be benefits to the game by having fewer tournaments. One, they would allow players to go and play internationally more, and that would help grow the game. And if you look at today's field of players, that certainly has happened so Mm -hmm. he was correct there and he also wanted the sponsors to be getting basically more bang for their buck and thought that that would help the game as well right thinking that if the sponsors could guarantee that the top players wouldn't be spread out at all these mandatory uh, events throughout the year but they would all play fewer tournaments but the big names would all be at the same tournament that that would be better for the, the the viewers as well so both good ideas for by uh, you know someone who has not only was a great golfer but always seemed to have the game at it, at his in his interest. I mean, I Sorry, looked right. up the stats. Okay, so in 1974, they played 44 events. In 2024, yeah. they played 39 events. It's five less events. Mm-hmm. But also the big difference is in 74 they started on January 3rd and they went to November 3rd. In 2024, they started on January 4th and went to September 1st. And I think part of that reason is the popularity of football. Mm-hmm. Golf knows that, hey, once football season kicks in, we can't really be playing, you know, major tournaments at that point in time. True. But it, True. then it allows them to do international competition, other competitions. They yeah. used to have and, and, and the, the skins games. I was just going to say, and the one thing that they do compete with football in and is huge is the Ryder Cup. The Ryder right. Cup. And, and I don't know when that started, but it goes in the fall and – Golf fans love the Ryder Cup. But also remember, with the European Ryder Cup, a lot of those guys went to live, and they can't come back and play on the the European team. Right. I'm reading a book. It's called Live and Let Die by, was it Alan Shipnick? And it's a great book about the PGA and the live and how they're trying to, how it's come about and how they're trying to coexist. People section. I love this story here by, about hockey players Phil Esposito and Wayne Cashman. They tell the story of how when they were playing in Russia, they thought their locker room was being bugged. Quote, they traced the electronic listening device to a small box concealed under a rug. We pried the top off, Esposito reports. Wayne then loosened a couple of things inside, trying to dismantle the thing. Then we heard a tremendous crash. That was how they detected that they had cut the support for the chandelier hanging in the room below them. So these guys were spies like us, I suppose. They were they were not the most clandestine figures. <laughs> I, like, I like the one about Jim Hart and his wife. Mm. That his wife hired a plane to fly over and said, happy 30th birthday to try to rub it in. Mm-hmm. You know, and she was play, She was a good practical joker. Yeah. But it's a, got a great ending. They're still married to today. Right. Wow. They, you know, they got they, married yeah. in 1967. Yeah, and they're still, they're still married. married. Yeah. That, that's great. Yep. I like the one about uh, that study that um, says that sex doesn't sap physical strength, according to this research by uh, Manfred Steinbeck, a professor of sports medicine at a university in West Germany, okay? And he was a 1960 Olympic long jumper. The whole thing about, you know, you can't have sex the night before event, he says that's that's hogwash. Right, that was a bunch of coaches would always say They would say say that that in boxing. They said a lot of boxers would would abstain from sex before... Fight. Was it Namath? Namath, I think, was the one that was like, uh, I'm going to put that I'll to take the a test. chance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Baseball, one of the best sluggers in the game with one of the best names, is once again off to a slow start. 1970 yeah. AL MVP Boog Powell. Uh, he was never worried about his slow starts. It was kind of um, the way he always did it, but 73 was a down year, so he's off to a slow start again and he said for the first time in my life i'm a little shook i'm pressing i look at myself i'm only 32 years old i should still be able to play at a high level but um he did not come out of it that year it was his last year in baltimore his 14 years as an oriole would end after that season in 1975 he goes to the indians Mm -hmm. has a comeback season does very well 27 homers and 86 rbis but he regressed 
in 76 and in 77 after a hand, where did he finish his career with the dodgers how oh, was who, it really who knew did he really yeah i didn't know that and then that was it he was done i've had his barbecue at camden yards <laughs> yeah it's over the right field wall yeah I've had that. yeah i mean he literally like retired before like right around then so it was it was always just yeah. a name you know yeah. what a you know what a cool name boog Powell. i saw him play when he was with the indians i just you're right the name I, yeah the I, name i, I remember me. boog because you know being a tigers fan he was you know he always hurt the tigers with yeah, the orioles yeah. because the orioles and tigers for a while were competing in the right. al east That's for right. the title yeah. so my story that i like in the baseball thing is doc ellis may 1st against the reds <laughs> he hits the first three batters in the game he threw six straight balls, and they took him out. So he had zero innings in that game. But I only think he gave, was charged, I think, with only like one earned run. I guess the mm -hmm. bullpen did a good job. But as bad as that game was, and he started the year like three and eight, uh, and he had like a four and a half ERA, which was a lot back in 74. Mm -hmm. He ended the year 12 and nine with 3.17 ERA. Oh, he must have been So he had a dynamic. strong, very strong finish to that season. But could you imagine starting a game and you hit – the first there'd be a well, fight there'd be a fight yeah and not only that the pirates have got to be like this steve blast disease is catching yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> i like did you see this about the astros taking three games from the cubs and two from the cardinals while losing only once but houston had a bad scare shortstop roger mm. metzger collided mm. with don wilson while running laps in the outfield and swallowed his tongue uh. all right back to gross things my mm. wife has just come to and now she's fainted again how do you swallow your tongue? And it was the catcher. What was it? Someone Edwards had to pry his jaw open. Yeah, Doug Radar and yeah. and, and uh, John Edwards. Yeah, had to I pry his jaw to, open yeah, to, to get his tongue out of yeah. there. Like he could, yeah, he yeah, he would have died. died. He would have died. Yeah. yeah, yeah. These nice guys finish first. Flyers and Rangers in an epic battle. What was it? The semifinals yep. of the uh, of of the NHL to see who would advance to the finals of the Stanley Cup. Uh, Broad Street Bullies style, you know, all year long, the, 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 the Flyers are just beating the crap out of everybody. Penalties here, penalties there. And then they get to the this series and the NHL says, we're not going to allow this anymore. So they had to actually beat them on the ice. Brad Park of the Rangers said, I didn't think the Flyers could do it, but they finally beat us with a good, honest hockey game. Behind Bobby Clark and Bernie Perrault, they won a rough and tough seven-game series, the Flyers did. Two Rangers players said, if we had to play 78 games a year against the Flyers, we'd all retire after one season because we'd all be worn out. They were just, they would beat you and then they would beat you. But people liked it. They said the Flyers set single game attendance records in five NHL rinks. So the spectators... They like they prefer gladiators to hockey players. Oh, so yeah. that style it would play nowadays. No well, question, you know. No because, question because because when the Kings and Oilers a, a, a bit ago got in a fight, everyone in the crowd was up pounding on the glass. So they still love the fights. And the picture they shows the two goalies with their mask on. And yeah, it, it looks like Jason from right, that's the right, right. You know, it's like they're ready to do a slasher film there. And you see, what do you think is said about Brad Park after one of the games that he sat dejectedly on a dressing room bench? His body was a mass of welts and bruises, and there were two ice bags strapped to his right knee. Mass after one game, right? I mean, they were really hitting right. and hurting. Yeah, they were. They were gladiators. Yeah. They really were. Uh, next up for Philly, Bobby Orr and the Bruins. Of course, we know how this turned out in Philly's favor. Perrant won the Conn Smythe Award, and you can hear Bernie on the Past Our Prime podcast talk about that series and more on last week's Past Our Prime show. Check it out. I, I think you'll be like all of us and fall in love with Bernie. He was just a, a wonderful interview. So. We still need to go out and have cheesesteaks with him. We, yes. we got to go for lunch. Yep, <laughs> for sure. Lord in the pits, Lord Alexander Hesketh. He, you know, was really into the Formula One and... Uh, James Hunt won the 75, I think, Dutch Grand Prix in his car. And, of course, James Hunt was the subject of the movie uh, Rush w that Ron Howard did with uh, talking about his relationship with Nicky Lotta, which is a fantastic movie. Yeah. If you've not seen it, even if you're not a racing fan, it's a really good movie. I highly recommend it. He also looks very similar. Chris Hemsworth looks very similar to James Hunt. They right. Really a, good. Yeah. yeah. James Hunt was like a macho looking yeah. guy and Nicky yeah. Lotta. It's a playboy. You know, Right, and, and then Hunt died very young, you know. Which, 45. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. How did he die? Did he, I didn't Heart know attack. that. Did he really? Yeah, yeah and he was that. a real macho looking guy. Yeah. Uh, while, well, you know, Nicky Lada lived a long life despite just, suffering just those burns. Just passed a couple and, years yeah. ago, yeah. They yeah. were big rivals. And then I love this kind of stuff. They they became friends. And in fact, Nicky's the one who eulogized him. It's a great article about this this young lord who, you know, he lived in such a, such a big house that they said they could have parked his Rolls Royces in in his fireplace <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i mean we're talking about Damn. wealth that's just unbelievable but anyway he got into racing and 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 it's a it's a very he said at one point i would like to win the indianapolis 500 with an all-girl pit crew can you imagine the look oh, yeah. on oh. aj foyt's face <laughs> James Hunt, as you mentioned, would leave Heskes at the end of 1975, go on and drive for McLaren. The following year, he won the Formula One World Championship. So Heskes had the right guy. He just didn't have him at the right time. For the record? I just like the one that um, Pete Maravich yep. accepted the trade. And then you get the draft picks and the guys they picked. It was Mike Sojourner. Had, they, had the number, they had two number twos and two number ones. So they got Sojourner one year. David Thompson, they drafted the next year. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, then the number, then their number two picks, Bill Willoughby, and then they traded the other pick. And then Pete Maravich goes on, and what is it? Uh, he he averages twenty five points in six seasons with the Jazz. Wow. And probably put people in seats as yeah. well. Right. So, so wait he, a sec. Hold on. Let me let me go back. They 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 drafted they drafted David. Thompson. Yes, I I meant to look up what how they didn't get him. That's the only part I he, didn't get. He to. went to the ABA. That's yeah, it. I think okay. he went to the ABA. Now, Mark, yeah. and you guys are big basketball fans. How would Pete Maravich's game play in today? Would he be one of those guys that's on every cover or on every highlight? Oh yeah, I think he transcends decades because he was such a dynamic. He yeah. had a little Harlem Globetrotter. That's it. Yeah. It was almost looked like a Harlem Globetrotter. It's player. kind of amazing that he was. In, in, in a sense, traded for David Thompson, who'd be the other guy of that era, yes. right. who would yeah, be true. like, you know, the sports center yeah. guy every night. So the other one I saw was that Bill Walton signs yep. a five-year deal with Portland for between two and $3 million, which was astronomical mm, back, back in then. those days. And that's 74. And I think a couple of years later, Walton leads Portland to their one and only yep. NBA championship, mm-hmm. right? With his mm-hmm. long hair. Right, right. We'll wrap it up at this point. I want to thank Bob Ryan for joining us and talking about that wonderful 1974 series. Banner number 12 for the Celtics. They're going for number 18 right now as the playoffs continue, but uh, that was number 12 for them. Also want to thank Lucius Allen for coming on and talking about what had to be a difficult finals for him to watch from the sideline because he was injured and watch his Bucks go down in seven to the Celtics. Tough one for him. All right, let's say goodbye. Mark, say goodbye. Goodbye. Bill? Bye. Jeremy, we can't hear you anyway, but he's waving. (laughs) We'll see you next week, guys, on the Past Our Prime podcast. See ya. See ya.